Thanks very much for, to the organizers for the opportunity to share some of the recent work I did for the World Bank on the Belt and Road. Um, Scott listed a number of very interesting questions, and I'm afraid this work I'm about to present will not answer any of the questions. <laughs> um, this is really my first paper um, loosely related to development financing, uh, hopefully not the last. But uh, in this ex um, exercise, um, I was tasked with the question of evaluating the role of uh, transportation network in the patterns of FDI with the application to the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, so let me start off with a very, very well-known fact, and that is, you know, the explosion in FDI is one of the most prominent features of globalization, especially the first decade after 2000, where FDI grew uh, substantially at annual rate of 8%. And, and that the vast majority obviously comes from developed countries, but the share of FDI originating from the South, from developing countries, in particular China, has also um, risen since you know the mid 1990s. And China now, in in fact, this last year became the second largest source country um, of FDI, just after Japan. Um, and as multinational firms engaging, you know, increasingly complex organization decisions around the globe, the spatial patterns and growth of FDI become very crucially dependent on the transportation of goods, inputs, and, and even people. Um, so not surprisingly, um, the vast majority of FDI um, concentrates geographically, and there is very strong and extensive evidence on the gravity in FDI. And if you look at the 2001 curve, so this is a chart where I basically plot the spatial distribution of FDI at different levels of distance. And you can see in 2001, about 40% of FDI happens within you know, 2,500 kilometers. Um, and if you move forward about 12 years, that share has fallen to about 30%. So multinational firms are definitely, definitely traveling further. So there is still very strong gravity in FDI, but that gravity has reduced over time uh, by some extent. Another way to see this um, style as fact is by estimating the distance elasticity of FDI. So this chart is basically summarizing some of the estimates I did by looking at how the distance elasticity of FDI varies by the mode of transportation and over time. And, and perhaps not surprisingly, you see that the, the air distance elasticity of FDI dominates the other two types of distance, the sea distance and the land distance, right? And the elasticity started with around minus 0.8 in 2000, which suggests that a 10% uh, increase in air distance is likely to be associated with a, you know 8% um, um, decrease in FDI. Okay, uh, but the the elasticity is much smaller for sea distance and land distance. And that ranking is consistent with the, you know, the self-selection of industries and goods and inputs into different transportation modes. If industries are, if goods and inputs are time sensitive, it's much more likely for them to choose air transportation over the other two types of transportation. And then the second pattern you see here is over time, the distance elasticity of FDI has fallen. Um, in fact, for the seed, for the air distance, the magnitude has fallen by about a half. And that could be driven by a number of factors. You know, multinationals are exploring new territory and they are trying to expand spatially around the globe. But in this particular exercise, I was asked to evaluate, you know, the role of transportation initiatives, the role of transportation network in explaining the growth of FDI and the, you know, the diminishing impact of distance. So, so, so the questions specifically I'm trying to answer here in this exercise are how has the diffusion of transport networks, including the proliferation of air traffic network, the, um, the increasing um, poor connectivity around the, around the world, and the introduction of you know, high-speed rail, how have these transport networks um, influenced the spatial elasticity of FDI? 
and how much have they contributed to the aggregate FDI growth um, overall, as well as across different country groups? And how much can we expect new initiatives such as the BRI to foster future global investments? Um, so the, the era, of the period from 2000 and to 2012, that's when I actually um, draw the, the, the analysis, is, a, is an era where you see tremendous transportation growth, right? And this is seen across the board. When you look at, for example, the number of flights, right, that has grown by over 60% uh, within you know, 12 years, 15 years. And the uh, sea connectivity, the poor connectivity across countries, the bilateral connectivity has also improved over time. And high-speed rail, there obviously you see the biggest uh, changes. But one thing to notice, ob obviously, is the high concentration of high-speed rail development in certain regions and countries, right? It was first rolled out in Japan and then spread out to Europe and the rest of Eastern Asia, but it's still very concentrated uh, regionally. And so just to zoom in some of the patterns, uh, this is the air traffic network. Um, not surprising at all. You see strong clusters of air traffic. Um, within not just continents, actually within subcontinents, right? You're seeing, you know, Central America, North America, Latin America, and they have their own very strong clusters of air traffic. And Russia and neighbor countries have their own network, East Asia, South Asia, and then Europe. Um, and then when you look at the liner shipping, the maritime shipping, right? And this is the latest data in 2019. And you see a mix of developed and developing countries uh, being the top 10 most integrated countries into the global shipping networks, right? So you see the US, and you also see European countries like Netherlands and Belgium. And you see uh, you know, Eastern Asian countries like um, South Korea, China, and, um, and uh, Malaysia, I believe. What is it? Malaysia? Yeah, Malaysia and Singapore uh, being the top 10 as well. So, so countries' connectivities and integration to global shipping network is very dynamic and is changing, right? And then finally, uh, the high-speed rail, right? Um, there, like I mentioned earlier, is the adoption of high-speed rail is highly concentrated. The early adopters included like Japan, and in Europe, it started with France, and, and um, it being the biggest player, and then gradually, uh, it got into Spain and Germany, and then the cross-border high-speed rail, right, connecting to countries bilaterally, also started with France and then the neighboring countries and so on. So, so the question I'm, I'm, I'm proposing here is, is a very, I would say, very bold question, and that is, you know, how, how have these transport networks affected the patterns of FDI and the growth of FDI? And uh, you know, one of the baseline specifications I look at is uh, the one in, on the slide. I look at you know, bilateral FDI between two countries over time as a function of the two countries' bilateral connectivities across different types of a transport network, right? including direct flights, uh, poor connectivity, and high-speed rail. Um, there are many challenges while controlling for many other things, right? So we obviously have to control for, you know, market size, uh, unilateral infrastructures, domestic infrastructures, preferential trade agreements, investment treaties, um, domestic policies and subsidies and so on. So, so we have to control these for these factors using a number of, um, you know, vector of dummies and so on. But there are many other, um, there are many challenges with this type of exercise, right? When I was first asked to do, um, in fact, um, when I was asked to evaluate the potential impact of a BRI, I thought to myself, this is just not possible. You know, um, the existing evidence on FDIs primarily uses, look at the effect of distance on FDI. Um, very little is understood how transport networks have affected FDI. But nevertheless, I, I said yes. So I, you know, I wanted to tackle this to the extent possible. And one of the biggest challenges is that these transport networks are adopted, right? Um, 
usually because you know there is a big demand for transfer networks. Um, you know the clusters you see regionally. There's reason for those clusters. You know because of the demand for transfer networks arising from you know current FDI growth or future FDI growth or other un, uh, other correlative factors, right? So in order to um, you know establish the causal effect of transfer networks on FDI patterns, we need to address this challenge. And, and to the extent possible. So what I, I did was to explore sort of semi-exogenous source of variations from the supply side, the supply shifters, the cost shifters of transportation technologies, right? Um, unlike the demand side, the cost side technology requirements of transportation technology development is less likely to be correlated with the demand for transport networks. So for instance, when we look at the volume of direct flights between every pair of countries, right? Um, here, a source of variations could come from the flight regulations on maximum flight time and the crew accommodations. And this strategy has been used in Philip and co authors a study, a recent study uh, in QJE, I believe, where you can s look at the, the regulations over time, right, which limit the, the, the maximum length of flight to be 16 hours recently. And and, um, and um, that roughly translates to you know seven eight thousand um, miles in great circle distance, right? So we could use that uh, technology requirement, right? That that um, supply requirement as a discontinuity to uh, to explore the effect of uh, direct flights um, for the liner shipping connectivity, right? The Container trade, right? The diffusion of container ports is one of the biggest um, uh, characteristics of transport networks. And that depends crucially on the pre existing depths of the cargo ports. It's extremely costly to increase the depths of cargo ports. But so the pre existing depths of ports is very important for a country's capacity to develop container ports and to be integrated into global shipping networks. So here, the source of variation I use comes from the pre-existing depths of cargo ports. For the high-speed rail adoption, as you saw from the European history of high-speed rail, it came from countries like France and Germany, which have the highest um, historical um, rail density. Um, so here, we think you know, this could be a plausible source of variation for the high-speed rail adoption. So putting everything together, right, including using these as instruments for the high transport networks, and, and then what we find here is that all three forms of transportation network positively affect FDI, as we, you might expect. And, and I think what is perhaps more useful is to look at the numbers. And what we find is a 10% increase in direct flights is roughly related to about 3% increase in FDI. Raising poor connectivity from the level of Indonesia and Thailand to really a very high level of connectivity between Korea and Thailand or Belgium and Netherlands, actually these two pairs share similar, similar levels of poor connectivity. FDI can actually increase quite tremendously by about 40%. Having a high-speed rail link is about a 20% increase in FDI, but it's the, the effect is not always statistically significant. Alternatively, we also looked at travel time. We, we, we get a measure of travel time between every pair of countries, and we see how travel time affects FDI, and we find a day decrease in travel time is about 6.6% increase in FDI. These are the direct effects on FDI, but they also reduce the distance elasticity of FDI that I showed you earlier, right? The decline in the air distance elasticity of FDI, a significant share of that comes from the proliferation of the transport networks. And then when you put everything together, we estimate the transport networks contributed to about 27% growth in global FDI in 2000 to 2012, and that is roughly about a quarter of the total FDI growth in that same period. Now moving on to BRI, I'm running out of time, but you know, so this is uh, FDI trends for, for BRI countries, and you can see the high income and upper middle income countries are the primary recipients of FDI, um, even, even 
even as of 2016. And when you compare the transport connectivity between BRI countries and non-BRI countries, one of the challenges with this analysis I already complained to Rory was that you know the list kept you know changing, and I was asked to update analysis you know very frequently because uh, you know you got to use the most recent sample. Um, and, but what you see here is that uh, for direct flights, this, this, these are the average number of direct flights or liner shipping connectivity at the country level. Um, what you see is in terms of direct flights and the liner shipping uh, in, and the high speed rail, there is still a significant gap between BRI countries, excluding China, versus non BRI countries. But in terms of poor connectivity, the picture actually, the ranking actually changes. The BRI countries' poor connectivity actually seem to be better on average than the non BRI countries. Okay, so what I did was to um, redo the analysis for just BRI countries and find that the sensitivity to transport connectivity is actually higher for BRI countries, right? The same uh, the estimates I just did, you know, were redone for the BRI countries and find these elasticities to be higher, right? For example, a 10% increase in direct flights is associated with 4.7 increase in FDI as opposed to 3.6. And if you're looking at the time elasticity, it's about 0.08 rather than 0.06. And then, obviously, there's a huge heterogeneity across BRI countries, right? So when you interact the travel um, network with the transportation network with host country characteristics like market size, income level, business environment, such as the you know the difficulty of uh, of enforcing contracts, the difficulty of of exporting and importing, the trade facilitation, you find the elasticity of FDI with respect to transportation costs, actually falls with market size and income and efficiency, meaning you know, the effect of transportation cost reductions is particularly large for low-income countries with low efficiency and, uh, and, and, um, and less openness to trade. Okay, so these are just some estimates across different country groups by income level, um, and you can see it increases, but not monotonically. Um, the, the, the response is particularly large for upper middle income countries. And then with, those, with the framework now in mind, with the estimates uh, in hand, I now incorporate the estimated uh, transport cost reductions from the research uh, from the World Bank, another team, in the, you know, the team in the World Bank. And they, they, they did a really heroic, uh, uh, um, put a lot of efforts into estimating the potential trade cost reductions from the BRI, the proposed BRI transport network. Not just for BRI participating countries, but also for non-BRI participating countries. And you can see the darker the color, the, the, the greater the expected reductions in trade costs. And you can see countries you know, in South Asia, for example, are, are predicted to receive the biggest reductions in trade costs. But you know, even for non-BRI countries, the reductions in trade costs are somewhere around 1% on, on average. So there is a spillover effect to non-BRI countries as well. So incorporating these estimated trade cost reductions with the estimated elasticities of FDI, and here is what I come up with for you know a sort of long run estimation of the BRI network for FDI, and um, what I find is the you know the average aggregate impact on FDI for BRI countries is about three percent. Again, you see this increase um, with uh, for for the low income countries. So the impact is much smaller for high income countries, but a lot greater for the low income countries. For non-BRI countries, it's about 1%. Given the estimated reductions in trade costs, it translates into about 1% increase in FDI for non-BRI countries. Now just to quickly summarize, so um, the exercise I did um, was looking at how the transport networks have flattened the spatial distribution of global investments and contributed to about a quarter of um, total FDI growth in 2000 to 2012. But it's worth noting the effects vary tremendously across the modes of transportation and across host countries, depending on you know, a range of host country characteristics, including market size, income, uh, efficiency, openness to trade, and so on. And BRI could raise aggregate FDI about you know, aggregate level is 3% for participating countries. But again, the impact is 
potentially much greater for low-income countries than um, high-income countries. So I'll stop.